Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War, or welcome to Battles of the American Civil War, whichever category you fall into, you're listening to the literal only podcast out there covering the American Civil War battle by battle, big or small. Show me one other one out there that's doing what we do. You can't, mm. because there's just none. They don't <laughs> exist. <laughs> but we're moving into the middle of January with hey. another three battles. We got one from Missouri and one from uh, Dover. Which I think is in Pennsylvania. Dover is in Tennessee. Tennessee. Um, and then we got a Bear River Massacre, which is in um, Idaho, where oh, the United man. States Army massacres well, a bunch of Shoshone Indians, particularly women and children. And that's what they do. And, uh, yeah, this is one of the messed up things of the world. We had one where the um, Confederates did it to a band of Indians down there in Texas mm. earlier on in 1862. Now we got the Union returning the favor, so to speak. You sure, I thought there was a Union did that as well. No, it was, uh, <clears throat> well, the uh, Confederates did it to a bunch of Germans, oh, remember, right. and then right, the Indians. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, we got three battles, Hartville, Bear River Massacre, which you can't even call a battle, I guess, and then uh, the Battle of Dover. Got the Battle of Hartville starting out January 9th through 11th in Wright County, Missouri as part of Marmaduke. John S. Marmaduke from the Confederates, his first expedition into Missouri. He led a Confederate raid into Missouri in early January 1863, obviously. This movement was two-pronged. Colonel Joseph C. Porter led one column comprising his Missouri Cavalry Brigade out of Pocahontas, Arkansas, to assault Union posts around Hartsville. When he neared Hartville, Hartville, not Hartsville, on January 9th, he sent a detachment forward to reconnoiter the rim. He <laughs> it succeeded in capturing the small militia garrison. Right. That same day, Porter moved towards Marshfield. January 10th, some of Porter's men raided other Union ins installations in the area before making contact with Marmaduke's column east of Marshfield. Okay. Marmaduke had received reports of Union troops approaching to surround him and prepared for a confrontation. Uh oh, he said, spaghetti. Oh, bring it on. January 10th, Colonel Samuel Merrill commanded an approaching Union relief it, column. It, it's an approaching. Right. From uh, Houston, Missouri. Houston, Missouri. Yeah. He and his command arrived in Hartville that morning, discovered that the small garrison had already surrendered, and set out towards Springfield. He's like, you bunch of cowards. His force went into camp on Woods Fork of the Gasconade River. Early on the morning of the 11th of January, the approaching Confederate under Porter made contact with Merrill Scouts and skirmishing commands. Commands. Well, Union side, we had Colonel Samuel Merrill. He had the 99th Illinois Infantry. Led by Lieutenant Colonel Lemuel Park, new guy, never heard of him. Mm -hmm. 21st Iowa Infantry, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel C.W. Dunlap, I think we've heard of him. Wounded. Oh, we had a detachment of the 3rd Iowa Cavalry, led by Major George Duffield. A detachment of the 3rd Missouri, Missouri Cavalry, led by Captain Thomas G. Black. And a section of the 2nd Missouri Artillery Battery L, led by Lieutenant William Walshmitt. Confederates, Brigadier General John S. Marmaduke. He had uh, Shelby's Brigade, which is Colonel J.O. Shelby, 1st Missouri Cavalry, Colonel B.F. Gordon, Major General, nope, Major George Kirtley. Oh, that dude was moited. 2nd Missouri Cavalry, Lieutenant Colonel C.A. Gilkey. 3rd Missouri Cavalry, Lou Colonel, <laughs> Lou Colonel, <laughs> uh, Colonel G.W. Thompson. I think we heard him before. Yeah, maybe. 1st Battalion, Missouri Cavalry, Major Ben Elliott. Quantrail's Partisan Rangers, which had uh, Lieutenant William H. Gregg. Wait, weren't they the Quantrail Raiders, and so now they're the Partisan Rangers? Yeah, look at that shit. Oh. Then you got Porter's Brigade under Colonel Joseph C. Porter. Uh, Burbridge's hey, Burbridge. Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel John M. Weimer led that one, just for this one. <laughs> Green's Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel L.C. Campbell. Uh, I bet, well, what, what happened to Green? Jeffers Regiment, Colonel William M. Jeffers, and he was not brigaded, though. Why? Hmm. McDonald's uh, Missouri Regiment, Colonel Emmett MacDonald. Mr. MacDonald. Mm, poor <laughs> guy. He expired that day as well. Well, what are you going to do? Moving on with the artillery, which the Confederate rarely oh, no, has. no, not brigaded was McDonald's Missouri. Oh, right. Not brigaded was McDonald's Missouri. But how? He was moited. He right, just didn't have a brigade. Just him by himself. <laughs> well, and his regiment, right. obviously. Right. Uh, artillery, which the Confederates are always outnumbered on. Right. Captain Brown's Arkansas Battery. Captain Lewis T. Brown did that one. 
And you got Lieutenant Collins' section of the Bledsoe's battery, later Collins' battery. Lieutenant Richard A. Collins. Look at that. He took over that. He let his legs. Uh, I'm well, sick of the hyphens. Right. <laughs> Marmaduke believed he was being pressed by several forces, so he diverted Porter and Shelby's columns along another road to Hartville. Meanwhile, observing this movement. Is that a song? Another road to Hartville. Another road to Hartville. Uh, meanwhile, Merrill marched his force directly to Hartville, where it took a strong defensive position on covered high ground west of the courthouse. Shelby and Porter's brigades attempted to dislodge Merrill's force, but it was too strongly positioned. Over a four-hour period, several Confederate assaults were made, each being repulsed in turn. Oh. Eventually, Merrill withdrew most of his force, although a third of the men under Lieutenant Colonel Dunlap never received the order and remained on the field until nightfall. Oh, no. Hey, good for him, though, huh? Right, I guess. Elements of both sides observed the other withdrawing from the field as night approached. Both claimed victory as a result. The real results were mixed. <laughs> from the Union command's perspective, they had repulsed Marmaduke's assaults, inflicting heavy casualties, but the Federals had been forced to leave the field. So, Well, they say who controls the battlefield is the winner, right? Right. From the Confederate perspective, Marmaduke had united his force and secured his line of withdrawal. He set up a field hospital in town and could claim to control the field briefly. Right. However, he was compelled to make a rapid retreat into Arkansas and then an arduous trek to winter camp. Yeah, I bet. Mm, so basically so. they were like, hey... All right, we'll go. <laughs> Both of them. Right. Additionally, the frontal assaults had resulted in the death or mortal, mortal wounding of several senior CSA officers, right. including Brigade Commander Colonel Joseph C. Porter, oh, no. Colonel Emmett MacDonald, yep. Lieutenant Colonel John Weimer, and Major George R. Kirtley. Wow. The raid itself caused great disruption of federal forces in the region, and a number of small outposts had been overrun, destroyed, or abandoned. However, How Ill. the other major objective, the depot at Springfield, remained in Union hands. Oh, well, good for them. Oh, shit. The successful escape of the raiding party did foreshadow the vulnerability of federal Missouri to fast-moving expeditions. Yeah, I bet. Wonder if you know what? I wonder if they'll exploit that later on. I doubt it, because Union should uh, heavily uh, guard it now. You would think, but well, what we've learned so far. <laughs> right. We know they're not the smartest. So that was uh, a pointless little thing there. Nothing yeah. really happened. Bunch of people well, died. Well, the union stopped them from taking over like Springfield. So. Right. Moving on. Moving on. Bear River Massacre, or the engagement on the Bear River, or we call it a massacre at Boa Ogoy. Anyhow, took place in present day Franklin County, Idaho, on the 29th of January, 1863. After years of skirmishes and food raids on farms and ranches, the United States Army attacked a Shoshone encampment gathered at the confluence of the Bear River and Battle Creek in what was then southeastern Washington Territory, Whoa. near the present-day city of Preston. Oh, yes, Idaho. Or, yeah, Preston. right there by Washington. Yeah. Cash Valley, originally called Shuhobiogai, <laughs> uh, Shoshone for Willow Valley. Nice. What's Willow the traditional? Valley. Sorry, guys. I don't see who, see uh, who be ogoy. See who be ogoy. Yeah, okay. It was a traditional uh, hunting ground for the northwestern Shoshone. They gathered grain and grass seeds there, as well as fish for trout and hunted small games such as ground squirrel and woodchuck. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck? And large game including buffalo, deer, and elk. Obviously. This mountain valley had attracted fur trappers such as Jim Bridger and Jedediah Smith, who visited the region. Was it Jedediah Smith and uh, the Simpsons? Jedediah. Jebediah Springfield, Springfield right. Uh, Cash, well, probably based on him, right? Uh, Cash Valley was named for the trapper's practice of leaving stores of furs and goods, i.e. a cache, in the valley as a base for hunting in the surrounding mountain ranges. Right. So impressed were the trappers by the region that they recommended to Brigham Young that he consider the valley as a location for a settlement of his Mormon pioneers. He's like, hey, man, you want you want to do a lot of your women? You want to have lots of wives? There's a good old spot. He's like, I don't think uh, Idaho will accept that later on. Maybe we'll do it in uh, Utah instead. Yeah, I mean, instead, Brigham Young chose Salt Lake Valley in the long term. Mormon settlers eventually moved to Cache Valley as well, though. And they went far as north there, and they went far south as Arizona. A lot of them are Arizona. They're everywhere. All right. As early as July 31st, 1847, a 20-man delegation of Shoshone met with the Mormons to discuss their land claims in northern Iowa, Utah. Okay. The establishment of the California Trail and Oregon Trail, as well as the founding of Salt Lake City in 1847, brought the Shoshone people into regular contact with white people uh -uh. moving westward. By 1856, European Americans had established their first permanent settlements and farms in Cache Valley, starting at Wellsville, Utah, and gradually moving northward. 
I mean, I can see why the Indians were pissed. Right. Brigham Young made the policy that Mormon settlers should establish friendly relations with the surrounding American Indian tribes. You could try. Right. He encouraged their help and he encouraged their helping to feed them rather than fight them. I mean, right. That's the way it should be. All right. Despite the policy, the settlers were consuming significant food resources and taking over areas that pushed the Shoshone increasingly into the areas of marginal food production. Oh, wait a minute, boys. Why can't we all just hunt this land? Like, nah. <laughs> right. Nah, you've been hunting long enough. Can't we just literally live in the same area? Right. I don't want a TV next to my house. David H. Burr. Those Indians. Those Indians only have one wife. What's wrong with them? Right. <laughs> Can you believe that? David H. Burr, a surveyor general of the territory of Utah, reported in 1856 that the local Shoshone Indians complained that the Mormons used too much the Cash Valley, that once abundant game no longer appeared, like buffalo used to roam. Now, none. Fish. Swim. Now, none. Birds. Fly. <laughs> now, none. Um, well, let's not, uh, <clears throat> let's not state the fact that it was the Indians that caused the majority of the buffalo to disappear. But uh, they used to, like, mass murder those sons of bitches. They used to run them off cliffs and, like, herds right. of, right. like, Just- fucking literally 40 or 50. They'd fall and they'd take whatever they can right. and leave the rest there to rot. And most of it, it was not bad. It wasn't good because when they fall like that, their whole insides All just right. ruin the whole meat. Explodes and, you yeah. know, you can't do that. I mean, they just wanted the fur. Well, and they used the meat and shit too, but uh, what they could, like I said, if the inside, if you're the bladder and all that, that contaminates the whole thing. And those buffaloes will fuck you up too. They're no, big as a play. freaking uh, Volkswagen. Well, <laughs> bigger than that, bigger than a uh, as big as like one of those Amazon damn delivery vans you see running all the way around. They are freaking huge, bud, like a moose, but stubby your legs. Uh, you see people still to this day. How many was last summer? All these iter- ignorant tourists in Yellowstone. Get, right. I want to get up a close picture. Mm-hmm. They say don't get within, like, what, 20 feet of them? Because those motherfuckers can charge fast. Well, that's what they say. I say don't get within three miles of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, they'll get you. Uh, uh, yeah, those and moose. There are two. Those are the ones that everybody's like, oh, no. Moose, moose will attack. Fuck you up. There's Special. videos of, like, yeah. people driving down the road in Canada, and all of a sudden a moose just comes out and fucking rams them. Dude. Not too much the bulls, but the... Uh, Oh, no, the bulls. No, the moose, the ma mooses, they really, really will. The foraging and hunting by settlers traveling on the western migration trails also took additional resources away from the Shoshone. Yeah. As early as 1859, Jacob Forney, the superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Territory of Utah, recognized the impact of the migrants, and he wrote this. The Indians have become impoverished by the introduction of a white population. Yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> They're sick of it. They had right. it up to here. Up to here. He recommended that an Indian reservation be established in Cache Valley to protect essential resources for the Wait a minute. Shoney. Why does it have to be an Indian reservation? Why can't it be a, Why can't it be a Mormon reservation? Right. Or be like, you people. guys came here and you guys stay on this reservation. Right. And then they started putting the young the girls into uh, schools and shit. Yeah. Yeah. Catholic um, schools. While his superiors at the United States Department of the Interior did not act on his proposal, though. Desperate and starving. See, they did it themselves. Desperate and starving, the Shoshone attack farms and cattle ranches for food, not uh, just for revenge, but also for survival. Right, you got to do what you got to do, do. I guess. But man, early spring on. of 1862, Utah Territorial Superintendent of Indian Affairs James Dwayne Doty, and that's not even a racist murder because uh, you mess with any ranchers, cattle or anything, horse thieves, or you go down. Well, my guess is even if it was another Indian tribe that had been taking all the resources, the other Indian tribe would have got starved and hungry and went and attacked them for food. Well, so That's what they did right. You think the the chiefs are there? You'd be like, you think these guys uh, think these guys would come and do this to us? They're like, yeah. So like we, they, they already are. <laughs> like, we should do it first, like, right? Yeah, right. He who waits is he who is dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> James Dwayne Doty says. He's the superintendent of Indian Affairs in 1862. The Indians have been in great numbers in a starving and destitute condition. No provisions haven't been made for them, either as to clothing or provisions by my predecessors. Right. The Indians' condition was such with the prospect that they would rob mail stations to sustain life. Oh, well, why not? Nobody purchased supplies of food and slowly doled them out. He suggested furnishing the Shoshone with livestock to enable them to become herders instead of beggars. I mean, that's smart. Yeah, teach a man to fish. Right. That's what they say. Yep. 
twenty eighth. But they already know how to fish. <laughs> right. <laughs> they took all their damn fishing away. <laughs> July twenty eighth, eighteen sixty two. We're going way back. Flashback. John, John White discovered gold on Grasshopper well, Creek. That's never good. This was in the southwestern Montana Mountains. Soon, miners created a migration and supply trail. Soon, miners created a migration and supply trail right through the middle of the Cache Valley, between this mining camp and Salt Lake City. Wow. The latter was the nearest significant trading source of goods and food in the area. When the American Civil War began in 1861, President Lincoln was concerned that California, which had just recently become a state, would be cut off from the rest of the Union. Yeah, I'd be concerned, too. You got, like, nothing in between you guys. Right. And when did a gold rush? Uh, 49ers. Yeah. 1849? Yeah. Uh, he ordered several regiments to be raised from the population of California to help protect mail routes and the communications lines of the West. Neither Lincoln nor the U.S. Department, U.S. War Department quite trusted the Mormons of the Utah Territory to remain loyal to the Union. I mean, they kicked them out of the East. Uh, yeah, they didn't trust the Mormons, despite their leader Brigham Young's telegrams and assurances. Utah War and Mountain Meadows Massacre were still fresh in the minds of military planners. What is that? They worried that the Mormons' substantial militia might answer only to Young and not the federal government. Well, that's why they're a militia. Colonel Patrick Edward Connor was put in command of the 3rd California Volunteer Infantry Regiment in order to move his men to Utah to protect the over the overland mail route and keep peace in the region. Oh, yeah. The opposite. <laughs> Upon arriving in Utah, he established, you think, I bet everybody in the East did not even realize how violent and ruthless the West was, dude. Well, you got to figure, it's only 1862. The legends of Wild Bill, Wyatt Earp, none of these guys yeah. even existed yet. Well, the West really didn't come around to the so 70s, after 80s. the Civil War. Yeah. Right, right. Um, yeah, they don't know what the hell's going on right here. Right. So it's like a whole new, it's a whole new world. I'm sure, though, they heard about, Oh, well, you can they definitely heard about the uh, Indian attacks and shit along the Oregon Trail. Right, that's and stuff. why they hate Indians. <laughs> right. Upon arriving in Utah, he established Camp Douglas, that is uh, Patrick Edward Connor. And this is adjacent to the current location of the University of Utah. Look at that. And he established as the primary base of operations for his unit. It was within a few miles of the Mormon Temple construction site in downtown Great Salt Lake City. Several incidents in the summer and fall of 1862 (laughs) led to the battle between Bear Hunter and Colonel Connor. These incidents related to broad struggles between <laughs> struggling in, over broads. Right. Indigenous peoples and European American settlers over almost the entire United States west of the Mississippi. West of the Mississippi. Uh, the attention of most of the nation's population was focused on the Civil War in the Eastern States. Isn't that a song too? The attention of most of the nation's population. <laughs> uh, some historians have overlooked these incidents because they occurred near the ill defined boundary of two different territories. Ill defined. Those of Washington and Utah. While the incidents took place in proximity, the administrative centers dealing with them were more than a thousand miles apart. Right. So it was difficult to integrate reports. Mm-hmm. For example, for years, residents and officials believed Franklin and the area of conflict was part of the Utah Territory, which is mm-hmm. not. Residents of Franklin sent, ele- sent elected representatives to the Utah Territorial Legislature. They were part of the politics of Cache County, Utah, until 1872 when a surveying team determined the community was in Idaho. When a resident of Summit Creek, now Smithfield, Found his horse missing, he accused a young Shoshone fishing in nearby Summit Creek of having stolen the animal. Robert Thornley, an English immigrant and first resident of Summit Creek, defended the young Indian and testified for him. He's like, no. I don't think so. I think your horse just ran off. Nonetheless, a jury of locals convicted the young Indian and hanged him for stealing the horse. Local history recorded the Shoshone's name as Pugwini. Later information reveals that Pugwini is the Shoshone word for fish. And so the man may have been saying, look at my fish, or I was just fishing. Oh, right. Paguini, Paguini. No, Paguini. The young Indian man was the son of a local Shoshone chief. Well, you don't oh. do that. Within a few days, the Shoshone retaliated by killing a couple of young men of the Merrill family, <gasps> gathering wood in a nearby canyon. I mean, eye for an eye, toot for toot, finger for a finger. Right. During the summer of 1859, a settler weenie for a weenie, <laughs> a pug. During the summer of 1859, a settler company of about 19 people from Michigan was traveling on the Oregon Trail near Fort Hall when they were attacked at night by people they assumed were local Shoshone. Why would they leave such a beautiful state? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Several members of the company were killed by gunfire. Oh yeah, Shoshone's got guns. Oh man, Shoshone's got a gun. <laughs> they're like, 
What were these Mormons do? Well, they weren't Mormon. These guys were Michiganders. And these Michiganders. <laughs> the survivors took refuge along the Port Newf, Port Newf, Port Newf River, Port where they Newf. hid among the bull rushes and willow trees. Three oh. days later, Lieutenant Livingston of Fort Walla Walla, leading a company of dragoons, met their survivors. He investigated the incident and documented what he called the brut- what. Yeah, what he called the brutality of the attack. All right. According to the Deseret News of September 1st, 21st, 1859, a detachment of Lieutenant Livingston's dragoons found five bodies at the scene of the massacre were mangled. Oh, man. A girl of only five years old had her ears cut off. What? Her eyes gouged, gouged out. Oh. Both legs amputated at the knees and by all appearances was made to walk on her stumps. That's bullshit. What the hell? Oh, so they, cut off, he... they probably cut off her legs first and made her right. walk around. Dude, that's the problem, too, with... These Europeans, the Americans, anybody that weren't Indian, they treated, especially the children, even worse than the adults. Because they were like, man, they didn't even care. September 9th, 1860, Elijah Utter was leading immigrants on the Oregon Trail when they were attacked by a group of presumably Bannock and Boise Shoshone. Despite settlers' attempts to appease the Native Americans, the Indian, they didn't know what they were saying. None of them know English. That's the problem. Right. That was half the problem. They couldn't communicate. Communication, isn't that isn't that what ruins every relationship? A lack of. Lack of or poor. Right. The Indians cured nearly the entire migrant party and drove off their livestock. Alexis Van Ernum, his family, and about ten others hid in some nearby brush, only to be discovered and killed. Oh jeez. Their bodies were discovered by a company of US soldiers led by Captain Frederick T. Dent. Lieutenant Marcus A. Reno came across the mutilated bodies of six of the Van Ornums. Oh, no. Oh. The survivors reported that the attacking warriors took four Van Ornum children captive. As a direct result of this attack, the Army established a military fort near the present location of Boise, Idaho. I bet they did. <laughs> along the migrant trail. Colonel George Wright requested $150,000 to establish a military post to sustain five troop companies. That's smart. Look at that. It's a lot of money. Uh, Zacchaeus Van Ornum, Alexis's brother, heard from a relative on the Oregon Trail that a small white boy of his missing nephew Reuben's age was being held by a group of northwestern Shoshone likely to be in Cache Valley. Well, Van Ornum gathered a small group of friends and traveled to Salt Lake City to get help from the territorial government. I think you're going to have to go get him yourself, bud. Yes, most likely. Well, there he visited Colonel Connor at Fort Douglas and asked for help to regain his nephew. Colonel Connor agreed and sent a detachment of cavalry under the command of Major Edward McGarry to Cache Valley to rendezvous with Van Ornum near the town of Providence, Utah. Van Ornum located a small group of Shoshone warriors being led by Chief Bear Hunter. He and McGarry's men followed Shoshone as they retreated to nearby Providence Canyon. After the Indians opened fire, McGarry gave the order to commence firing and to kill every Indian they could see. I don't think he said Indian, though. Probably. A skirmish between the Shoshone and United States Army lasted about two hours after the Shoshone established a defensible position in the canyon. Finally, Chief Bear Hunter signaled surrender by climbing a foothill and waving a flag of truce. What kind of flag? Doesn't matter, right? Together with about 20 of his people, Chief Bear Hunter was taken prisoner and transported to the soldiers' camp near Providence. When asked about the young white boy, Bear Hunter said that the boy had been sent away a few days earlier. McGarry instructed Bear Hunter to send his people to bring back the white boy. White boy Rick? He held Bear Hunter and four warriors hostage. By noon the next day, the Shoshone returned with a small boy who fit the description of Reuben Van Ornum. Was it, though? Zacchaeus Van Ornum claimed the boy was his nephew and took custody and pardoned to return to Oregon. The Shoshone protested, claiming the boy was the son of a French fur trapper and the sister of Shoshone chief Washaki. I bet it was. So why'd they take him? Why would the Shoshone people give this boy to him? They had no and then they protested, saying the boy was right. the son of a French fur trapper. Right. He was the son of a businessman or something. And the sister. And a sister of Shoshone Oh, the French chief. fur trapper got with the chief sister right. and had the kid. Um, you think that's where they But got. why would they take the kid over there to the white people in the first place? It doesn't make any sense. After federal troops left with Van Arnhem and the young boy, McGarry reported to Colonel Connor the boy's rescue without the loss or scratch of a single man or horse. Bear Hunter complained to the settlers in Cache Valley, arguing they should have helped him against the soldiers. Why? They're like, dude, you've been stealing our cattle and food. And After a confrontation between Bear Hunter and some warriors from his band, aw, is it Bear Hunter in the band? <laughs> the Bear Hunter band? <laughs> Nearly 70 of the groupies. <laughs> <laughs> I had an orgy right there in Cache Valley. After, after a confrontation between Bear Hunter, some of... 
some warriors from his band and nearly 70 members of the Cache Valley Militia, the settlers donated two cows and some flour as the best and the cheapest policy as compensation. Oh, good for him. Look, he got anything. Right. December 4th, 1862, Connor sent McGarry on another expedition to Cache Valley to recover some stolen livestock. Damn, there's a whole backstory on this damn <laughs> Right. Holy the Shoshone shit. broke camp, fled in advance of the Army troops, and cut the ropes of a ferry at the crossing. McGarry got his men across the river but had to leave their horses behind. Oh. Four Shoshone warriors were captured and held for ransom, although they did not appear to be related to the theft. McGarry ordered that these men's would these men would be shot if the stock was not delivered by noon the next day. The Shoshone chiefs moved their people further north into Cache Valley. A firing squad executed the captives and dumped their bodies into the Bear River. <laughs> yeah, because the other guys were like, they're not part of ours. Right, we, we don't, don't give care. a shit about them. In an editorial, the Deseret News expressed concern that the execution would aggravate relations with the Shoshone, which I assume it would. It's already aggravated. Right. You can't tell me the Shoshone didn't know what the hell was going on with the Sioux and the uh, Dakotas. A.H. Conover, the operator of Montana Trail Freight Hauling Service between mining camps in Montana and Salt Lake City, was attacked by Shoshone warriors who killed two men accompanying him, George Clayton and Henry Bean. Arriving in Salt Lake City, Conover told a reporter the Shoshone were determined to avenge the blood of their comrades, killed by Major McGarry and his soldiers. He said the Shoshone intended to kill every white man that should meet on the north side of the Bear River. So they should be fully avenged. <laughs> the final catalyst for Connor's expedition was a Shoshone attack on a group of eight miners in the Mon- on the Montana Trail. They had come within two miles of the central Shoshone winter encampment north of Franklin. The miners missed a turn and ended up mayor- mired and lost on the western side of the Bear River, unable to cross the deep river. I mean, I- well, it's your own fault, guys. Uh, three men swam that across the guy the at the map. He was like, I think we were supposed to turn back there. He's like, you can- I know where we're going. Don't backseat drive. The wife's like, let's stop and ask for direction. Right. Like, don't you talk to me, woman. <laughs> People in back see her fall off. He's like, oh, damn, she must ask for directions again. <laughs> Some bitch. Three, <laughs> three men swam across the Richmond where they tried to get provisions and a guide from the settlers. Before they returned, the other five men were attacked by the Shoshone who killed John Henry Smith of Walla Walla and some horses. When the Richmond people returned with the advance party, they recovered the body of John Smith and buried him at the Richmond City Cemetery. Damn. The surviving miners reached Salt Lake City. I wonder how many people named John Smith the Indians killed. A lot. It's still like the most popular name today. Right. It's crazy. William Bevins testified before Chief Justice John F. Kinney and swore an affidavit describing Smith's moita. He also reported that 10 miners en route to the city had been moited three days before Smith. Kinney issued a warrant for the arrest of Chiefs Bear Hunter, Sandpitch, and Sagwich. He ordered the territorial marshal to seek assistance from Colonel Connor for a military force to effect the arrest of the guilty Indians. Due to such reports, Connor was ready to mount an expedition against the Shoshone. He reported to the United States War Department before the engagement. <laughs> and he says this, I have the honor to report that from information received from various sources of the encampment of a large body of Indians on Bear River in the Utah Territory, 140 miles north of this point, who had sediments in this valley to the Beaver Head Mines, east of the Rocky Mountains, and being satisfied that they were a part of the same band who had been murdering immigrants on the overland mail route for the last 15 years, and the principal actors and leaders in the horrid massacres of the past summer as well. I determined, although the season was unfavorable to have an expedition in the conquest of the cold weather and deep snow, to chastise them if possible. Can we just chastise them? <laughs> in many ways, the soldiers stationed at Fort Douglas were spoiling for a fight. In addition to discipline problems among the soldiers, there was a minor mutiny among the soldiers for a joint petition yeah, by most of the... because these soldiers sitting there like, we want some freaking action. Dude. Right. They want something. Uh, well, most of the California volunteers requested to with over, withhold over $30,000 from their paychecks for the sole purpose of instead paying for naval passage to the eastern states. Right. They want to go fight. serve their country in shooting traitors instead of eating rations and freezing to death around sagebrush fires. Right. Furthermore, they said they would gladly pay this money for the privilege... Of going to the Potomac or Potomac and getting shot. No shit. These guys. The War Department declined this request. What? You got some real Americans here ready to lay down their life. Yeah, those are the ones you don't want, though. Right. <laughs> they get there like, hell yeah, just get off and like, start. <laughs> <laughs> America, fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't want a. Uh, uh, um, that kind of soldier. <laughs> Uh, what do they call them? Um, right. Er, 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 um, erratic. 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 Right. Yeah. 
You Throughout know, most of January 1863, soldiers at Fort Douglas were preparing for a lengthy expedition traveling north to the Shoshone. Connor also wanted to keep the word of his expedition secret, making a surprise attack. Oh, you do don't say, don't tell nobody. Right. Making a surprise attack upon the Shoshone when he arrived. To do this, he separated his command into two detachments that were to come together from time to time on their journey to Cache Valley. His main concern was to avoid the problems that McGarry had faced in the Oilia action, where the Shoshone had moved and scattered even before his troops could arrive. The reaction to this military campaign was, <laughs> some were like, yeah, some were like, Ehh. George A. Smith in the official journal history of the LDS Church wrote, Uh-oh. it is said that Colonel Connor is determined to exterminate the Indians who have been killing the immigrants on the route to the gold mines in Washington. Small detachments have been leaving for the north for several days. See, I think that's the problem, too. They went in to just exterminate. You know, all oh, these guys are savages. Maybe they didn't know. That's how the Indians, they live with each other. When you come in and be like, hey, man, that's not how we do stuff. But, on another hand, <laughs> when you got, like, people coming in, I mean, that's what the whites do. They're Europeans, not whites. Europeans and all the Span- Spaniards and all these guys, they just come in and be like, you must let me do this. Right. You must let me come in here and and if not, right? If not, uh-huh. so either or. I mean, who's wrong and who's right? Nobody. <laughs> right. Anybody uh, who moid us right. is wrong. Exactly. If the present expedition Bastards. copies the doings of others that preceded it, it will result in catching some friendly Indians, murdering them, and letting the guilty scraps or scamps remain undisturbed in their mountain hunts haunts. Right. Nine times out of ten, the guys right. that are doing this are not right. going to be within the main party. And all you're doing is pissing them off even more when they come back. Like, these niggas has murdered my fifth wife. Damn it. The Deseret News in an editorial expressed. With ordinary good luck, the volunteers will wipe them out. We wish this community rid of, of all such parties. And if Colonel Carner be successful in reaching that bastard class of humans who play with the lives of the peaceable and law-abiding citizens in this way, we shall be pleased to acknowledge our obligations. Okay. The first group to leave <laughs> Fort Douglas was 40 men of Company K, 3rd Regiment of California Volunteer Infantry, commanded by Captain Samuel Hoyt, accompanied by 15 baggage wagons and two mountain howitzers, uh-oh, totaling 80 soldiers. They left on January 22, 1863. Second group was 220 cavalry, led personally by Connor himself with his aides and 50 men each from companies A, H, K, and M of the 2nd Regiment Cavalry, California Volunteers. They left January 25th. As orders specific for this campaign, Connor ordered each soldier to carry 40 rounds of rifle ammunition and 30 rounds of pistol ammunition. I mean, that should be enough. You would think. If you use it sparingly. Uh, but these, that's the problem. Yeah, 300 men, so what, 300 times 40? It's a lot of rounds. <sighs> I hate in movies like westerns when they're hiding behind stuff and they just go pew 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 and they hide again. I'm like, it just wasted like all those rounds. That's just stupid. Just to have a shootout. I mean, I guess it's just for movies, but that actually happens. Probably. I'm like it's the dumbest thing in the world. Waste all that ammo. Yeah, we can do. And then you're out of ammo, especially the South with the artillery. They'll sit there and shoot for hours, knowing they're not hitting no targets. Yeah, but it's also uh, to keep them from moving and doing things. This was a total of nearly 16,000 rounds for the campaign. In addition, nearly 200 rounds of artillery shot were brought with howitzers. Wow. As a part of the deception, the cavalry were to travel at night while the infantry moved during the day. Company Connor was the former U.S. Marshal and Mormon scout Orrin Potter Rockwell. Okay. <laughs> On the evening of January 28th, Captain Hoyt's infantry finally arrived near the town of Franklin, where they spotted three Shoshone who were attempting to get food and supplies from the settlers in town. The Shoshone received nine bushels of wheat and three sacks. Okay, thank you for their order. <laughs> Fantastic. William Hall, the settler who was assisting the Shoshone, noted later, We had two of the three horses loaded, having put three bushels on each horse. When I looked up and saw the soldiers approaching from the south, no. I said to the Indian boys, Here comes the Tokashis which was Shoshone for U.S. soldiers. Maybe you will all be killed. They answered, maybe the Tokwashes, Tokwashi, yeah, the, maybe the Tokwashes will be killed too. Oh. But not waiting for the third horse to be loaded, they quickly jumped upon their horses and led the three horses away, disappearing in the distance. They're like, yeah, That's getting out of here. All right. The sacks of grain carried by the Shoshone were later found by the third California volunteers during their advance the next day. 
apparently dropped by the Shoshone in their attempt to get back to their camp. They were like, screw it. They were hauling ass, right, too. Right, right. Screw it. Colonel Connor met up with Hoyt that evening as well, with orders to begin moving at about 1 a.m. the next morning for a surprise attack. But an attempt to get a local settler to act as a scout for the immediate area led the actual advance to await until 3 a.m. This military action occurred during perhaps the coldest time of the year in Cache Valley. Yeah, that's probably, probably why he didn't want to go. <laughs> right. Local settlers commented that it was unseasonably cold, even for northern Utah, and it may have been as cold as negative or uh, 20 degrees. That's it. On the morning of the 29th when the attack began. Cold. Yeah, it's not. With wind? Yeah. Hmm. Several soldiers had come down with frostbite and other cold weather problems, so the third volunteers were only about two-thirds of their strength compared to when they had left Fort Douglas. Among the rations issued to the soldiers during the campaign was a ration of whiskey. Whiskey? was a ration of whiskey held in a canteen. Several soldiers noted that this whiskey froze solid on the night before the attack. False. Whiskey don't freeze. No. Nope. If it did freeze, that's not whiskey. That's some watered-down-ass whiskey. <laughs> the, the, the U.S. government is like, we'll just give them watered-down water whiskey. Right. It's... <laughs> Wow. It is apparent that the Shoshone chiefs were far from ignorant of the potential for a conflict with Colonel Connor's obviously. soldiers. And some minor preparations were made simultaneously, obviously. I mean, come on now. You guys think these guys, people are dumb? Right. They're probably smarter than you, sons of bitches. I mean, they survived all this time. <laughs> Most of this involved mainly gathering foodstuffs from surrounding Mormon sentiments uh, from residents of Richmond, Utah. Right. Most of the firearms that the Shoshone had at the time of the attack had been captured in minor skirmishes. They'd been traded from fur trappers or white settlers and other Native American tribal groups. Or they simply antiques that had been handed down from one generation to another over years. Yeah. The weapons were not as standardized or well-built as the guns issued by the Union Army to the soldiers no of the shit. California volunteers. Uh, Bear Hunter and the other Shoshone chiefs did, however, make some defensive arrangements around their encampment in addition to simply selecting a generally defensible position in the first place. Willow branches had been woven into makeshift screens, hiding the position and numbers of the Shoshone. Which is good, because willow branches are very flexible. Uh, <laughs> they also dug a series of rifle pits along the eastern bank of the Beaver Creek and Bear River. Fantastic. At the same time, the arrest warrant was issued by Justice Kinney. Chief Sagwich, who was named in the warrant, was in Salt Lake City trying to negotiate peace on behalf of the Northwestern Shoshone. All right. Got to do something, right? Correspondent for the Sacramento Union reported. The prophet, Brigham Young had told Sagwich the Mormon people had suffered enough from the Shoshone of Cache Valley, and that if more blood were spilled, the Mormons might just pitch in and help the troops. Oh. oh. And that Shoshone guy was like, that's the Sagwich was like, motherfucker. You, you do what you must. He's like, really? Really? Well, it appears as though the deception by Connor to hide the numbers of his soldiers involved in the confrontation was successful. The Shoshone were not even then anticipating a direct military engagement with these soldiers. Instead, they were preparing for a negotiated settlement where the chiefs would be able to talk with the officers of the U.S. Army and try to come to an understanding. Well, no, we're way past talking and understanding, guys. Right, right. Uh, Major McGarry and the 1st Cavalry units of the 2nd Regiment California Volunteer Cavalry arrived at the massacre scene at 6 a.m. just as dawn broke over the mountains. Due to the weather conditions and deep snow, it took time for Connor to re- uh, to organize his soldiers into a battle line. Damn, they're coming into a battle line right away. Ain't no negotiations whatsoever. The artillery never arrived as they got caught in a snowdrift six miles from the Shoshone encampment. Oh, jeez. How'd they get caught in a snowdrift? They're just walking in a snowdrift. like, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> just drifted, uh, drifted on us. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> just nav right. Chief Sagwich noted the approach of the American soldiers, saying just before the first shots were fired, look like there is something up on the ridge there. Look like a cloud. Maybe it is steam come from a horse. Mm. Maybe that's them soldiers they were talking about. It's a lot of maybes. Right. <laughs> Especially the steam from a horse. Well, Maybe they're that a, cloud. a lot of them. And initially, Connor tried a direct frontal offensive against the Shoshone positions, but was soon overwhelmed with return gunfire from the Shoshones. Overwhelmed, huh? The California volunteers suffered most of that direct combat-related casualties during this first assault. After temporarily retreating and regrouping, Connor sent McGarry and several other smaller groups into flanking maneuvers to attack the village from the uh, side. That's what you should have done in the first place anyways, Connor. Honestly, that's what you always do. He directed a line of infantry to block any attempt by the Shoney's to flee from the attack. After about two hours, the Shoney had run out of ammo. Mm. According to some late reports, some Shoney were seen trying to cast lead ammunition during the middle of the battle and died with the molds in their hands. Wow. Bear Hunter was moited. 
with some later reporting that he had been among those casting bullets. Madsen described the possibility as, eh, right. doubt it. California volunteer suffered 14 soldiers killed and 49 wounded, seven mortally. After the officers concluded the battle was over, they returned with the soldiers to their temporary encampment near Franklin. Franklin residents opened their homes to wounded soldiers that night. They brought blankets and hay to the church meeting house to protect the other soldiers from the cold. Connor hired several men to use sleighs to bring wounded men back to Salt Lake City. Connor estimated his forces killed more than 224 out of the 300 warriors. Dang. He reported capturing 175 horses and some arms and destroying 70 lodges and a large quantity of stored wheat and winter supplies. He left a small quantity of wheat on the field for the 160 captured women and children. Oh. The death toll was large. Some Shoshone survived, though. Chief Sagwich gathered survivors to keep his community alive. Sagwich was shot twice in the hand and tried to escape on horseback, only to have the horse shot out from under him. He went to the ravine and escaped into the Bear River near a hot spring, where he floated under some brush until nightfall. Well, good for him. He was in a hot spring. Sagwich's son, Bishop Timbimbu, was shot seven times but <laughs> survived and was rescued by a family members. All right. Damn. Other- this is a modern, or the uh, first 50 cent. Right. Other members hid in the willow brush of the Bear River or tried to act as if they were dead. Sagwitch and other survivors retrieved the wounded and built a fire to warm the survivors. All right. <laughs> there was a large difference between the number of Indians reported killed by Connor and the number counted by the citizens of Franklin, the latter being much larger. Settlers also claimed the number of surviving women and children to be much fewer than what Connor claimed. In, 19, in his 1911 autobiography, Danish immigrant Hans Jasperson claims to have walked among the bodies and counted 493 dead Shoshone. In 1918, Sagwitch's son, Bishop, Frank Tim... His name's Frank Warner. <laughs> his, his white name? I guess. In 1918, Sagwitch's son, Bishop, whose name is actually Frank Tim Bimbo Warner, said half of those present got away and 156 were killed. He went on to say that two of his brothers and a sister-in-law lived as well as many who later lived at the Washakie, Utah settlement, the Fort Hall Reservation in the Wind River County, in the Wind River Country, and elsewhere. Based on a variety of sources, Brigham D. Madsen estimates about 250 were killed in the definitive history of the massacre. The conflict marked the final significant influence of the Shoshone Nation upon Cache Valley and its immediate surroundings. In addition, it opened the north part of Cache Valley to Mormon settlement. Cache Valley also offered a staging area for additional settlements in southeastern Idaho. Got rid of the Shoshones, now we're good to go. Friction between the Mormons and Colonel Connor continued for many, many, many more years with accusations of harassment of non-Mormons in the Utah Territory and criticism by Mormons of Connor's attempts to begin a mining industry in Utah. Oh, poor guys. Chief Sagwitch and many members of his band allied with the Mormons. Many were baptized and joined the Latter-day Saints Church. Chiefs. Sagwitch was ordained as an elder in the Melchizedek Priesthood. Members of this band helped to establish the town of Washakie, uh, Utah, named in honor of the Shoshone chief. Most of the remaining members of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone built farms and homesteads under uh, church sponsorship. Their oh, descendants wow. became largely integrated into mainstream Latter-day Saints oh, society. Shit. Wow, look at that. Look at the Shoshone. Right. The Shoney were sold out. Right. The Shoney who were not involved with the settlement went to the Fort Hall Indian Reservation or the Wind River Indian Reservation. According to published newspaper articles, Colonel Connor and the California volunteers were treated as heroes when they arrived at Fort Douglas and by their community in California. Connor was promoted to the permanent rank of Brigadier General and given a brevet promotion shortly afterward to the rank of Major General. Look at him. Major General Connor. Connor com- campaigned against Native Americans in the West for the remainder of the United States Civil War, leading the Powder River Expedition against the Sioux and the Cheyenne. All right. Bear River Massacre site is located near U.S. Route 91. The site was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1990. The Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation acquired the site in 2018 to protect it as a sacred burial ground. Okay. Good for them. They intend to erect a, erect a monument in memory of the massacre's victims. The Smithsonian incident will be... The Smithsonian Institution repatriated two Shoshone human remains, that of a teenage man and a woman who was in her 20s when she was killed, back to the Shoshone people for burial. The remains were returned in 2013. Wow. So was it really a massacre? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how they say massacre. Right, because they're guys were fighting back and all right. that good stuff. It's not, massacre. Like they, not like they just went right. in and started killing people. Massacre is like 50 people in a pool of swimming and you come in and just... 
throw a toaster in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that would do damage, but maybe like a uh, that's a massacre. Uh, uh, a large conventional oven, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on. That was a long one. We had a whole freaking three-year history of a... Uh, it could have been a movie. It wasn't even really that long. I bet it was a movie. We made it that long. <laughs> I bet it was a movie. <laughs> it could be. Mm. Going on to the Battle of Dover. We're going to old Tennessee. It's also known the second battle of Fort Donaldson. Yeah, Fort Donaldson. Oh, shit. Happened on February 3rd, 1863, Stewart County, Tennessee. Late January 1863, Confederate Major General Joseph Wheeler commanding two brigades of cavalry, took a position on the Cumberland River at Palmyra to disrupt Union shipping. The Federals, however, apprised of Wheeler's intent, refrained from sending any boats up or downriver. Unable to disrupt Union shipping, he realizing that he and his men could not remain in the area indefinitely, Wheeler decided to attack the garrison at Dover, Tennessee. He was like, oh, damn. And he said, uh, which informers reported it was small and could easily be overwhelmed. Confederates set out for Dover and began an attack between 1 and 2 p.m. on February 3rd. The 800-man garrison under the command of Colonel Abner C. Harding was in and about the town of Dover, where they had chosen camps that commanded the area and had dug rifle pits and battery emplacements. Oh, shit. The Confederates mounted a determined attack using artillery fire with great skill, but were repulsed with heavy losses. Oh. By dusk, both sides were mostly without amul... amul- <laughs> By dusk, both sides were with... Mo- By dusk, both sides were mostly without ammunition. The Confederates surveyed the Union defenses and decided that the enemy was too well placed to allow capture. Right. Wheeler's forces retired. Federals sent out a pursuit, but to no avail. The Confederates had failed to disrupt shipping on the Cumberland River and capture garrison at Dover. This both things failed. Right. This Confederate failure left the Union in control of Mid Tennessee. And a bitter Brigadier General Nathan Bedford Forrest denounced Wheeler. A favor of General Braxton Bragg. He was like, man, I would not serve under this dude again. I would not, General Braxton Bragg. Right. You need to get this Wheeler guy out of here. Right. He sat at the river, didn't see anything, and I was like, let's go here. Oh, shit, we're getting shot at. This is too much. Let's go. Oh, idiots. <clears throat> and that's going to do it for us And this episode of uh, Three Battles. I'm not calling the second one a massacre because it wasn't a massacre. So. Yeah. Not a massacre. What was the actual name of it? There was a battle of something. Battle of Bear River. Was that what it was? Yeah. Be sure. Yes. Mm. Um. Yeah. Two short ones, and that Bear River was <laughs> the history of Idaho. <laughs> right. And uh, Utah in that one. But and all uh, the families just Shoney. Right. <laughs> what they had for lunch. Oh shit. <laughs> Fucking ridiculous. Seas. Uh, well, that being said, we'll be uh, back next week for. The- I really hope that Wakashi's wife gets over her diarrhea spell. Right. <laughs> We get it. We'll be back next week for the Yazoo Pass Expedition and Fort McAllister. Um, two kind of long ones there. And then um, Yazoo. We got William T. Sherman and Ulysses S. Grant. Oh, the big boys, back huh? In the, uh, back in the mix. The big boys coming to play. And uh, other than that, go check out patreon.com forward slash bang dang for all of our shows ad free and early. $2 a month. Go check out our YouTube bang dang, bang dang network. Subscribe over there for clips and uh, YouTube exclusives. Trying to get those numbers up. Also, leave a review on Apple or uh, Spotify. Let's get this. Uh, let's get Wait, people on, hearing man. about this show. Let's out freaking there, do people. it. Let's Other, freaking and do it. Go check out our uh, code for Omaha Steaks. <gasps> Omaha. I don't know what it is at this time because we're recording well in advance before it's we get our code. But grand. we're definitely going to get. A code for Omaha Steaks. We'll put that in the description, so go use that. And we'll be back next week for two more battles of this American Civil War just getting started in the year 1863. We'll see you next week. We're the Muds of Michiganders with Bang Dang.